Okay, so uh, my name is Chuck Watts, past president of the uh, First Empathy Surplus Congress and your uh, Zoom master uh, of ceremonies. And today's the uh, April 2021st uh, Caring Citizen Solution Day speaker series. Uh, and our keynote speaker today is, uh, is Dr. George Lakoff. And uh, welcome, Dr. Lakoff. And before we introduce you properly, I'd like to invite the, the current first Empathy Surplus Congress president, Anna Bruffy, uh, to say a few words. Uh, president uh, Anna, it's all yours. Thank you, Chuck. And welcome everyone to the first Empathy Surplus Congress. Before I ask Chuck to introduce you, Dr. Lakoff, I would like to recognize our first Empathy Surplus Congress board. First, in addition to Chuck, our board director for Human Rights Pocket Bench, Pocketbook Venture, I want to recognize Greg Kennedy, our president-elect and HR specialist living in Painesville, Ohio, and our treasurer, the Reverend Miriam Spagett, a local William, Wilmington, Ohio Quaker pastor. Thank you, Greg and Miriam, for all you do. Also, I want our YouTube oh, excuse me. I also want our YouTube subscribers to know our First Empathy Surplus Congress is a member organization of the Empathy Surplus Project, a 5013 volunteer collective thought leadership training community of practice. Every day we strive to frame a caring society that promotes stronger people, progressive markets, better futures, effective government, and mutual responsibility. We do this with four empathic activities. I'm going to ask our congressional board members to help me tell you what the four empathic activities are. Absolutely, thank you, President Anna. Uh, all of our four empathic activities keep us aligned with our uh, collective thought leadership training mission. And uh, the um, actions all start with the letter I, inward, inward digestion, uh, investment, uh, implementation and invitation. Uh, we inwardly digest and use the latest brain insights of Dr. Lakoff to frame daily caring conversations to promote uh, human rights. Miriam, tell us about the second empathic activity of investment. Thank you, Chuck. We invest in weekly congressional hearings about how we apply Dr. Lakoff's insights to advance caring policy directions. Greg, tell us about the third empathic activity of implementation. Thank you, Miriam. We implement caring policy directions through partnerships with ethical businesses, effective government task forces, and other caring society organizations. Chuck, tell us about the third empathic activity of invitation. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we invite others to join us and promote a politics of care. And back to you, Anna. Thank you, everyone. Greg, would you please tell everyone how they can help build an empathy surplus in their communities with a human rights pocketbook venture? Thank you, President Anna. I'd be happy to. Our parent organization, the Empathy Surplus Project, joined the United Nations Global Compact in 2014. In fact, we joined to implement partnership around policy directions growing out of Dr. Lakoff's 10-word progressive philosophy he laid out in Don't Think of an Elephant. Moreover, we thought the Global Compact 10 principles to help ethical businesses make progress on human rights, living work leisure and anti-corruption of government for the sake of climate survival aligned well with our four empathic activities. Furthermore, we launched the Human Rights Pocketbook Venture in 2018 to use the Illustrated Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a framing tool to facilitate collaboration around the community service of youth human rights education. And every year in our centers of influence, we want to distribute a pocketbook copy to every teacher and student in kindergarten, third, sixth, ninth, and 12th grades, as well as first year college students. Our donors and volunteers are currently responsible for donating about 2000 pocketbooks per year. You can find uh, out more at www.empathysurplus.com. Back to you, Anna. Thank you, Greg. Chuck, would you please introduce our speaker? You bet, Anna. I'm honored to introduce my uh, friend and progressive mentor, cognitive scientist and linguist, uh, Dr. George Lakoff. 
discovered Dr. Lakoff's best-selling book, Don't Think of an Elephant, uh, the Thursday after candidate John Kerry presidential election loss in 2004 to uh, George Bush. And Wilmington, Ohio progressives have just helped uh, Kerry's campaign staff clean out their headquarters. And, uh, and then we retired to the bar across the street. And uh, moreover, one of our friends pulled out her dog-eared copy of uh, Don't Think of an Elephant and passed it around. And, and um, she thought it'd be an, uh, a good act of group therapy after the defeat. And she suggested that we gather over a beer uh, to discuss a chapter a week. And that 10 week discussion group has been described by my only daughter, a, a preacher's kid as my uh, Damascus Road experience. Uh, Dr. Lakoff's description of empathy as the soul of democracy and the fact that it can be physically expanded and human brains through language and experience uh, became a focus for me. Over the next 12 months, I gave away about 100 copies of the book. And quite often, I'd refer friends to the last section of Don't Think of an Elephant about how to respond to conservatives. And moreover, I was and am especially appreciative of Dr. Lakoff's focus on empathy when encouraging his students not to, not to fight uh, with their conservative relatives over a Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, but rather, Dr. Lakoff said, invite your relatives to tell you what community activity they're most proud of that helped the most people. And Dr. Lakoff explains that that question activates the empathic neural system and strengthens it. I'm so focused on changing my own language that I, uh, I made flashcards of the vision, values, principles, philosophies outlined in Dr. Lakoff's book. And um, moreover, I watched the DVD and around Thanksgiving the next year, Rockridge launched an, an online community called Rockridge Nation. And uh, Rockridge Nation invited its members to, to enter a 30-day online commenting exercise to, to recruit a community advisory board. And I was honored to be a part of that advisory board beginning in 2005 and uh, was pretty devastated in April of 08 to learn that Rockridge was closing uh, due to lack of progressive funding. And one year later in 09, I launched the Empathy Surplus Project uh, to continue the collective thought leadership training offered by Rockridge. And in 2013, my work as a financial advisor and caring citizen took me to San Francisco Bay Area. And um, while I was there, Dr. Lakoff and his wife, Kathleen, were gracious enough to receive me in their home. And I so appreciated his encouragement to continue the Empathy Surplus Project. I was proud to help um, the Berkeley Rotary Club uh, present Dr. Lakoff with a, a Paul Harris Fellowship Award. Seven of Dr. Lakoff's books uh, appear on our recommended reading page of our website. They include Your Brain's Politics, which we're uh, studying currently, uh, The Little Blue Book, uh, The Political Mind, Whose Freedom, uh, Moral Politics, Don't Think of an Elephant, and thinking points. And when I reached out to Dr. Lakoff about speaking to us today, he said, let's, let's pick a timely and pleasant topic. We've been through too much death and illness among family and friends. So today's going to be a, a Q&A. And uh, I invited you to uh, submit questions, uh, which you've done. And I shared those, uh, shared about 20 questions with Dr. Lakoff so he could choose the questions he wanted to tackle first. So please uh, put yourself on mute and uh, help me uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Dr. Lakoff. All right. Uh, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay, thanks. Good. Uh, let's see, I, there might, uh, I, I'd rather just have people ask me their questions. Uh, they're all good questions, I, I, you know. How do you choose among your children? You know, <laughs> you know they're all wonderful questions. Uh, so, um, you know, why don't you guys just go ahead and ask whatever you want these questions or any others? I mean, it, uh, you know, they're all good. Well, that's good. So uh, let's let's uh, why don't we use the um, the uh, uh, tool at the bottom? I think there's a, a reaction tool where you can raise your hand and. Uh, uh, and I know a lot of you have submitted questions, so uh, so raise your hand and uh, 
We'll get to it. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> We're all friends. I, I had my hand raised. Okay, there you go, Greg. Go, go for it. Okay, Greg. Greg, Greg okay. is up. I see it now. Okay. And right. then we're going to do so, Arthur. <laughs> so Dr. Lakoff, um, what is the most effective way to reframe a statement in order to get a person to think about your perspective? Well, um, you have to know who you're talking to, mainly. And you have to know, uh, I mean, there's a question I ask, which is, um, you know, what are you most proud of that you've done to help other people? Just straight, straight off question. And um, most people. Uh, George, uh, let, me, let me interrupt just for a second. If, if, you're, um, if you're waiting to, to ask your question, can you put yourself on mute, please? There you go. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, George. So when you ask a question, what are you most proud of that you've done to help other people? Most people have done stuff. And that's the, the remarkable thing is that, uh, you know, whether they're, you know, liberals or conservatives, uh, if they're, they're good folks, uh, they've done stuff. And that answer, the answer to that question opens up a discussion of empathy. And empathy is what democracy is about. Uh, you know, most people don't understand that, uh, but you can't have democracy without empathy. That's, that's you know, the, the reason that you have democracy is that you care about other people, period. If nobody cared about anybody else, you couldn't have democracy. <laughs> it just wouldn't be there. You know, uh, that's, that's why you have democracy. That's why you have democratic institutions. That's why you have voting. That's why you have all of these wonderful things that we have in this country. And, um, you know, it's important to remember that empathy is what democracy is about. You know, without caring about other people, you wouldn't have it. So, uh, you know, empathy is not uh, an odd idea. It's not weird. It's not strange. It's not foreign. It's, it's the most basic thing you have uh, especially with people you care, care about. Anytime you say, you know, who do you care about? You're talking about empathy. Great, great. I think Arthur had, a, had his hand up next. Arthur, Arthur? can you unmute? There you okay. go. Okay. No. <laughs> Hello. Yes, I'm down here in, in, in Baja, Mexico, where I live, uh, but I'm actually in a, waiting in a dental office for so I'll be having a, <laughs> may have to leave shortly. Um, I'm, uh, my question is, we've been working on developing uh, what Gary Davis uh, in our film, The World is My Country, called The People Powered Planet. And it basically is how do we create a, a world in which we have small inter interactive groups like these kind of Zoom meetings, uh, but he called them syntegrity groups, interacting in such a way across political boundaries and across the divisions uh, that we can begin to amalgamate the, the will of the people at a global level. And my question is, could you imagine uh, uh, having a structure, meeting sort of like this Zoom meeting, but that, uh, that had people from across, like Arabs and Israelis uh, on opposite sides of the war, red states, blue, green states, or whatever, <laughs> but that all across all the divides, you bring people together and you have a certain kind of dashboard of, of tools that as people are talking helps them focus on, uh, you know, what's the, uh, what is it we really want in our lives, what are our goals, and keep people off this win-lose uh, uh, battling back and forth and brought us into empathetic uh, uh, syn 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 synergy. Um, what, what do you, what are thoughts have you given to the possibility of, of evolving such an interactive tool where these kinds of Zoom meetings could really cross political boundaries and have maybe even a like a bot that pops up and says, uh, you know, do you want assistance with this? You know, you have a heated debate, you know, and it would pop up things suggesting how do you, how do we, how do we move toward uh, focusing on our goals and what's in common and empathy? Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, a lot. Uh, there's a, a long period uh, before I retired <laughs> when um, I had uh, 
uh, a very close friend uh, and colleague uh, who is Muslim. And, um, you know, we used to have coffee almost every day. We went to the same cafe and at the same time and would sit down and talk. And um, the, uh, uh, um, the discussions were very interesting because uh, though I'm Jewish and uh, he was Muslim, uh, we had a lot of the same opinions about most things. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the difference there didn't matter to us at all. And we talked about that a lot. And, and a lot of it had to do with the question of, um, uh, you know, when does history begin? When does history begin uh, if you're Muslim? When does history begin if you're Jewish? And you have different answers to when your uh, religious history begins. But the point is that once you get beyond that, uh, you can be friends, which we were for many, many years. He's, we both retired, so I haven't seen him a whole lot since. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, we were just, we, we would have coffee regularly and, um, and talk about, you know, all sorts of stuff where we largely agreed. Uh, you know, we weren't fighting about stuff. The only, as I said, the only difference was you know, when does history begin? And, and when do you say uh, this, you know, we go back to such and such. And that's not anything we were debating, particularly, just noticing that we had different opinions about that. And then about this other, as, as long as we were talking about substance, there wasn't much difference. So, uh, Matthew, let me get you uh, unmuted. What's your question? Hello. Um, I am very interested in sort of the social scene here in, in our country. And I wanted to ask about your views for the prospects for social reconciliation and what that will look like and sort of how long it will take for the American nation to be rebuilt after such a four years of, of rupture. Um, the, uh, what's interesting about this and, and, and interesting about Joe Biden in particular is that you know Biden starts out by saying uh, I'm president for all the people, whether you voted for me or not. I don't care. I care about your concerns. I care about what's life for you every day, uh, about your job, your job, about your family, about uh, do you have enough to live on, about uh, your you know what your kids are doing. Uh, can kids get into schools? Can they get into colleges? You know. Uh, I don't care your, uh, what your affiliation is politically. Uh, I want to know what your concerns are as people, as Americans. And that's the right question. You know, I mean, you just ask questions about people as in their everyday lives, as citizens of the country, whatever their, you know, whatever they, whoever they vote for. And it turns out that there's a huge overlap that you know, people aren't that different. So uh, Mark Esparato from Toronto. That's me, thanks, Jack. Dr. Lake, this is a little bit more uh, specific in a way, but um, up in Canada, I, I joined a group about a year and a half ago working on voting reform, so more or less changing our electoral system. In Canada, we're really pushing towards proportional representation, um, but I know in the States, uh, there's a group called Fair Vote, which has been pushing for rank choice voting, which it hopes then will lead to proportional representation later. Um, so I guess my question to you is, uh, do you have any framing opinions on uh, electoral reform, changing the voting system to include everybody's vote in terms of re representation? And have you worked with any groups uh, locally or nationally in the States to, to do anything about electoral reform? Uh, there was uh, a period when the idea of ranked choice voting was very popular in Berkeley. And uh, they tr it was tried out and it didn't work very well. Um, and uh, it had to do with the fact that um, uh, campaigning, it didn't work with political campaigning. That is when you're campaigning, you're not campaigning for you and somebody else's second choice. Uh, and it, it just didn't fit with what was going on in 
local political campaigning and definition of issues. That was the problem. I mean, we tried it here. Uh, it, it was a, a, a very bad failure. We all thought it would be great. And, uh, you know, it didn't work because your second choice had a very different view of, your, of what was most important than your first choice. Um, I can just tell you that that was the experience here. I don't know how it would be other, in other places, uh, but if you would think that if it was gonna work anywhere, Berkeley would be the place and, uh, and it didn't. So Anna, let me get you. Uh... Hi, good afternoon. Um, my question is, is I, I work, um, I'm coordinating with Guyana in South America. Um, so my question is, and I'm, I'm creating a proposal for some big corporation people. So how, what would your recommendation for them to make, how, how can we encourage empathy to large businesses who have the capacity capability to take care and assist people of lower class um, so that they can help arise, rise up from their current environment? Well, um, I think <laughs> there's a very simple thing, which is, <laughs> do they want more customers? <laughs> you know, it, it, you know it, it's, if you think about it, uh, if you're running a company and you have customers who buy whatever product you're selling, um, you want more customers, <laughs> you know? So you actually should be caring about the people who are customers and why they're customers and what good they get out of your products. So to think about your business that way is what's important. And to think about how to, to uh, who is not buying your product, who you think you should, and who you think would benefit from it, uh, is to have empathy for your prospective customers, not just sources of income for you. But if you think about, um, you know, your prospective customers as people that your company cares about, because if they're buying your product, you should have a product that benefits them. I mean, you might not have a product that benefits them and that's too bad and that's not great, but presumably people buy products because they get some benefit out of them. So you wanna know why they get benefit out of them, what benefit they get and how they can spread that. Just change the questions that are asked. So Aaron, Aaron from Mainville, Ohio has a question. Um, Dr. Lakoff, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were on utilizing empathy to try to uh, kind of close the gap between Republicans and Democrats that we're all experiencing right now. Um, how could we go about that and where do we even start with, you know, the kind of parallel universes that are going on uh, with regard to media and uh the influence that's having and then the, the division that it's causing between Republicans and Democrats. Well, I think Joe Biden has a good start. You know, he says, look, uh, uh, I'm gonna be, I'm president. I'm gonna be president of all of you. Uh, I don't care if you voted for me or not. I'm gonna be president for you. And that, that's the right answer. You know, I care about all of our citizens, whether you voted for me or not. I care about you, even if you don't uh, have my politics. You know, that is, uh, do you care about your fellow countrymen, period, whatever their politics are? That's the place to start. And I think uh, Biden has a good start on it. Mary Tom has a question. Let me get see if she, she wants to be unmuted. I may have, I've got her question. You want me to ask your question, sweetie? No, I've got it. I've got, got it. it? I, I, yeah, the, the glare on the screen was, it's a beautiful day out there. So I was on the deck. So, okay, so here's my question. I, I want to say first though, about the, the gap between Republicans and Democrats or progressives and conservatives. I had, this morning, I had to run into the library for a special meeting 
and afterward, because we had not been meeting in person for so long, I had an hour co long conversation outside with, you know, one of the Republican members of the library board. We had a great time. We told stories, you know, and in those stories were the threads of commonality, you know, you know, the people we cared about in our lives who we're reconnecting with, and that included each other. I mean, he and I, you know, he and I have worked together for many years. So, you know, I think, you know, if we sort of put the, put the partisan stuff aside and the, you know, the, 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 where things put the rub, rubbing places, you know, places of conflict aside and hear each other's stories, then you come to some common ground and begin to understand and, um, uh, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe understanding is the best place to come out. Anyway, so that's my speech for today. So my question though is, so uh, uh, Dr. Lakoff, um, so who do you think is delivering effective progressive messaging now in the, you know, in the larger scheme of things? You know, what makes their messaging effective and, you know, what can we learn from them about our own practice? Well, um, there are two interesting, diff very different, interesting such people in California uh, who are very active politically. Uh, one is Nancy Pelosi, of course, uh, who's an old friend and, and uh, who I admire tremendously. And she wants to know what can get done that helps people, period. If, he can't, if she can't get it done, she doesn't worry about it. She goes off to get something else done, <laughs> you know? And she's very effective. And, uh, you know, and she keeps a list of things that uh, she wants to get done in the future. And if uh, anything comes up from that list that's possible, uh, she acts on it. I mean, she's always thinking about in that way about, you know, what, what can I do next? You know, how can I do it effectively? How does it work? If it can't work, we'll put it aside for now and do something else that works. And constantly do something that works. So that's, that's Nancy. And uh, I admire her for this. And I think the world of her. And then there's Adam Schiff, who's a very interesting guy. Uh, Adam is a very deep thinker. He thinks about what ought to be done, even if it isn't so, isn't so easy to do right now. And uh, that's just the, the, uh, the flip side of Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> you know? It's what has to be thought about in advance, even if you, know, you can't do a lot of stuff about it immediately. But you need to think about it. And if you're not thinking about it and talking about it, it's never going to get done. So if you put the, those two modes of thought together, it helps. So uh, Miriam. Has, uh, has her hand up from uh, Wilmington. <clears throat> Hi. Um, well, I had three questions I'd sent in. It's hard to know which one I want to do. And, and Mary Tom touched on, uh, you know, who do you think is, is uh, doing our messaging of progressive, uh, uh, caring and compassionate and empathy uh, <clears throat> in in the news today, and <clears throat> um, so I wondered who who you felt that, but you just said that President Biden and VP Harris uh, have made it possible for many citizens to be vaccinated to be protected from COVID nineteen, and um, so that goes along with our our what we want as a strong a nation of strong, healthy citizens to be active in civic projects. So that sort of answers that. Um, so I think I'm gonna go with this one. We want trust, honesty, and open communication in our communities and amongst our lawmakers on Capitol Hill because of the breakdown of open and honest communication through conservative driven messaging Many people distrust the science behind the vaccine and are hesitant to take it. How can we work on establishing trust when the lawmakers on the Hill are so untrustworthy? Recent events have made it plain that we should not waste any time or energy waiting on conservatives to cooperate. Thank you. 
Uh, you need to have um, people who are well known uh, in politics and in the media shown in very short three to five second clips being vaccinated. And they, the message is very clear to say the vaccine uh, works. Uh, it doesn't hurt. Look at my arm. And, um, and not only that, it not only helps you, it helps other people because it keeps, it, keeps, it thing, it keeps the, the pandemic from spreading and eventually allows us to wipe it out. Now, you can say that in what, four seconds? <laughs> That's the message. Very simple. Very good picture. Needle in the arm. Have people who are well known saying it within those four seconds over and over and over. Very simple. And it, it's, you know, uh, and, and people will do it. I mean, if you say, hey, here is a message that, you know, um, you know you're going to get vaccinated. Do you want to be on TV saying something like this? You're in your own words, uh, but getting this idea across, uh, can you do it in three to five seconds? Probably can. You know, you get lots of people doing it, all sorts of people, you know. You know, here's the vaccine. It works. It doesn't hurt. Look, I'm here. You see the needle in my arm? It doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, it helps. And not only that, it keeps things from spreading. Boom. Three to five seconds. Lonnie yeah. Franks from uh, Dayton, Ohio. Hi, uh, I was uh, kind of muted and my video was off, but uh, I have a different question. Um, and it really relates to cognitive stuff. Um, I'm working with a group called the Peace Literacy Institute, and they're trying to get peace education in public schools in particular. They've been very good in Montessori schools so far. A lot of the concepts are allegorical and are somewhat difficult to teach. Uh, we are piloting a program in Orange County school systems using Oculus Quest 2 virtual reality headsets to enhance kind of the immersive experience of learning. In the long run or in the next year, we've asked Sony for $3 million and development kits from them so we can expand our efforts. So my question is, do you believe that virtual reality or augmented reality, extended reality, along with artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, in this case, looking at having a private avatar tutor or a study group, can these technologies improve learning or am I wasting my time? Uh, I don't know, frankly. Uh, Darn. And, and I think it, I think it varies a lot from person to person and group to group. Um, there are people who learn that way and people who don't. And uh, you want to take advantage of the people who do. Uh, you know, virtual reality can be really, really interesting, and a lot of people, uh, you know, really like it. If you have something interesting uh, you know, and compelling on there, and if it's something that looks dumb, if it's, a dumb, if it, if it's an avatar that looks sort of stupid, then it's not going to work. <laughs> you know, if it if it's um, something that uh, you know people can can see as a possibility and can uh, emotionally connect with, that's different. But being, being able to do, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, virtual reality in that way is hard. You know, most of what I've seen isn't very good. So the question is, uh, you know, this is an art. It's an art form. And who are the, who are the most effective artists? And uh, I don't know. I don't know that world very well. The only person I know who's really involved in it is J. Ron Lanier, um, who's a friend who lives up the hill from me. But, uh, you know, that's it. I, I really don't know that world. And um, 
but the, the real question is, is this something that really grabs people? Uh, and, uh, you know, that is question. Who, who, who is an artist? And who are the artists in this who are able to do that? So it's not a question of the medium. It's a question of the um, artistic abilities of the people using that medium. So um, uh, we, we've got some people who haven't uh, asked a question, but Greg, we're circling back to Greg, who's got another question. Go, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So Dr. Lakoff, um, asking people to not think of an elephant is a great example of reframing. I wanted to know, did, did you have any other examples of reframing that work other than asking people to not think of an elephant? They're everywhere, uh, you know. Uh, the um, uh, you know, if you think about um, uh, democracy uh, being based on empathy, for example, very important thing to do. Uh, you know, democracy is all about empathy. You know, uh, authoritarians don't have empathy. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, can you imagine Donald Trump with empathy? Come on. <laughs> the one thing he has nothing of. <laughs> the, the, uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the interviews with him, but boy, zero. <laughs> you know, uh, you take him to uh, people who, soldiers who died in World War II, and he says, these are losers. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, it's just incredible stuff. But the point is that most people do, and you want to engage that in empathy. And we live in a country based on democracy, and people don't see consciously how democracy is based on empathy. You couldn't have democracy if you didn't care about other citizens. And I, I think that's a question to ask. It's an interesting question, you know. Could you have democracy if you didn't care about anybody else? And I think the answer is no. You know, I, you know, I, I just don't, don't think that you can do that. Uh, and one of the, the ways in which uh, you see um, the voting rights being extended in Georgia, for example, is based on this. If you say what's behind what's going on in extending voting rights in Georgia, it's about people caring about other people, period. I mean, that's, that's really what it's behind, uh, behind it. It's not said overtly, I think, because it's assumed as such so basic that you don't have to say it. But you really do have to say it, don't you, Dr. Lakoff? You do have to say it. Now, I, I, it's much better to say it. Most people assume you don't have to say it. But I think saying it, changes the way you think about democracy. You know, people, I think, don't fully appreciate democracy enough. You know, um, when I think about, uh, when I think about it, I almost get tearful. Uh -huh. You know, we're so lucky to be living in a country that has it. We're so lucky that we had people setting up our government that way and setting up our ideals that way. It's so fortunate. Uh, I remember uh, I was for, uh, my mother used to take me to vote with her <laughs> inside the voting machine uh, when I was like seven years old. She took me wow. there, she says, I'm gonna show you how to vote. Yeah. And she says, the first thing she said is you never miss a chance to vote. Yeah. yeah, nothing's more important. Yeah. So uh, um, my father, about that age, uh, had a one sentence way to think about these things. He said, um, you know, there's nobody more important than you and you're not more important than anybody else. Hmm. One sentence when I was seven, never forgot it. 
So we got some uh, follow-ups, it looks like. Um, uh, Mark Gasparato may have a, uh, a follow-up question on, on voting. Uh, Mark, where are you? Can you unmute? There we go. I, I can do that. I, I don't want to take any any more time up on on the specifics. Oh, come on, of Mark. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I guess um, up, up here in Canada, I've been looking at it as branding um, proportional representation as an equality issue. Um, so a few things. So like uh, essentially from, from your book, like uh, whose freedom um, equality is just simply freedom for all. Uh, and political representation is a freedom in many ways, especially here in Canada, where we, we do have the right to representation, even though that's, that's actually not even very well known. Um, so I guess in many ways, uh, uh, do you have any recommendations in terms of uh, communicating uh, the simple fact that um, political representation uh, not only guarantees people freedom, but having it regardless of winners or losers is actually an equality issue? Well, it's a very important thing. And the question then is, uh, what counts as a group? You know, uh, and in Canada, it's very different than in the US. In Canada, you have native peoples as a group, right? You don't have that in the US, right? And that, it's an important group. I mean, you gotta, you know, it, it's not just that it's Canada, it's that's who you have. Uh, it's a way to think about people and group them uh, and, politi and, and give them political rights and then allow them to have political organizations and political discussions and, and so on. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we just got, uh, and Biden just appointed uh, first Native American woman uh, to be, you know, one of his, you know, major advisors. Uh, you know, in, in, in the American Southwest. It didn't happen before. It's very important that you have someone like that who is very active in, in her community and in her state uh, to be out there uh, as uh, a representative with connect, direct connection to the president. Uh, you know, so political representation is very important and, and it's important to know what political representation means. Uh, there are, there's two very different forms. One is voting and the other is appointments. And appointments matter. You know, who you appoint, who a, a political leader appoints, uh, you know, in, uh, in local areas is a, a very big deal. And I think uh, Biden has been doing a very good job of it. And he understands that, and uh, that wasn't happening before that. <laughs> so we've got um, three questions, um, follow-ups, it looks like uh, Miriam, and then Lonnie, and then Mary Tom. So Miriam, Miriam's coming back. Okay, thank you. Um, I had one question. We want progressive markets and businesses who operate with integrity Capitalism does not seem to encourage that. By its very nature of competition, products are gradually reduced in quality using cheaper components and labor in order to be competitive in price. Secrecy and protection of creative ideas means we don't get the benefit of collaborative thinking. How do we point out the evils of capitalism and talk up the progressive market ideals? Uh, there's an interesting book by Robert Reich called Saving Capitalism. Uh, and the, the idea is basically that capitalism should have empathy. It should be built into it. Because, you know, if you're trying to sell products, you want, you, you know, there are people who have to buy them. And you want those buy, buyers to benefit from the products and to know why they benefit from them. That's a part of empathy. You know, capitalism really ought to embrace empathy because people who are selling products ought to care about how their products improve the lives of the people who are to buy them and why those people should know that. 
I mean, it, it seems to me so, so basic an idea that I, it's sort of remarkable. Uh, the people running these things say, okay, you know, uh, we'll just, you know, use our advertising, uh, you know, in some way or other to sell our products and we don't care as long as they sell. But you should care. And the advertising should bring out the role of caring and the role and to make people aware of why you benefit from them and how you benefit and why that benefit's important. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a part of capitalism that needs to be uh, brought out and to show that, that actually you can make more money that way. So, um... Lonnie, did you have a follow-up? I did not. I just forgot to put my hand down. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so Mar Mary Tom had a uh, had a question in the uh, in the chat. Uh, Mary Tom, do you want to ask your your question in the chat, or do you want me to? Oh, she's coming in. It's hard to see the chat from out on the porch. I'm coming in. Well, you know, I thought I liked my question, but I decided I didn't because the original question was <laughs> about how does cognitive science account for the um, disparity in um, responses to public health guidelines and all that. But I think the implication there is that, you know, those of us who are complied and are getting our vaccinations and all that we're empathic and those other people aren't. So that, so I want to reframe my question. I want to ask, how does empathy play into the responses of those who have been compliant? You know, and how does empathy play into the responses uh, of those who have, that we call non-compliant? I mean, to, to help question. us understand that, you know, how empathy might play out for them. Am I screaming? I feel like I'm screaming. I could no, be. No, you're well, not screaming. Another way to think about it is a word that people use a lot more, which is responsibility. And the point is that uh, responsibility is responsibility for others, not just for yourself. I mean, there's a Republican version of this, which is a personal responsibility for you. <laughs> But in general, for most cases, if you say, what does it mean to be a responsible person? You have to say, who are you responsible for and to? You know, who do you, who do you care about and who are you responsible to for various reasons? Uh, you can be in a company and responsibility to your, responsible to your boss, but it could also be for the sake of, of your customers, presumably. And, um, the idea that capitalism uh, should take into account being responsible for the care of your customers is an important idea. If you're selling a product, it really should make people's lives better. I mean, you know, that you can have advertising that claims it, it may not make people's lives better, and you may be cynical about that. But if it really does, and you can show it, you can sell more of your product. You know? And the idea that you should be making products that really do make people's lives better is an important idea. And it, that idea ought to be out in public. It ought to be discussed on the news. It ought to be discussed on commentators, uh, on you know, political commentators and so on. Uh, it's, it's an important question it's not seen as a political question, but it is. So, so Major League Baseball is taking a very responsible position. You bet. I am proud of Major League Baseball for that. <laughs> Me too. So that, that's a good segue into a, a question from, from one of our, our partners, uh, and she wasn't able to come, but um, Dr. Vicki uh, Casanova, uh, and she's the uh, co-executive director of the U.S. Human Rights Network. She, she writes, words are vitally important, but they don't seem to be enough to resolve the current racial reckoning dilemma, even among those formerly on the same team. Uh, how can the serious racist tension and divisions, even among some allies, 
best be managed as we work to build the caring, empathic, and united culture necessary to advance human rights at home? Uh, I think uh, you need to have um, a politics that's not based on racism or anything like race or any version of it. You know, you need to have a politics that is not for your race or, you know, but for everybody. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, the key. Right now, you have lots of people who are saying, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, I'm Asian or I'm African American or I'm white or whatever. And I want my people to benefit most. And I'm, I'm, I'm only caring about that. That should never happen. It just should never happen. I mean, you're an American, you know, whether you're Asian American or African American or whatever, you're American, period. You should be caring about everybody. Uh, and that's what patriotism is about. It's patriot patriotic not to be involved in identity politics. Identity politics is deadly. You have to transcend identity politics and care about everybody. And, you know, you have a lot of people who are deeply involved in identity politics, and they think that just because they have, you know, their people uh, have been left out, they feel, and they got to get theirs. And getting theirs makes things better, which it does. But it's not the right way to think. You know, it's identity politics. It's like, uh, I'm, gonna care, I'm not going to be caring about my fellow citizens. I'm going to be caring about people in my race or people in my ethnicity. And it's just, you know, not how Americans should be thinking. So an, Anita uh, has, a, has a question. And uh, Anita Lewis from Sugar Creek Township, Ohio. Hey. Hello, Dr. George. Uh, right, my question was, how can we put conservatives on the defensive? How can we what? How can we put conservatives on the defensive when they're being like uh, Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher who um, will... Um, manage to reframe poverty as an individual failing. And uh, right. you know, they made people believe that each individual had to solve their own problems. So you, know, you try not to go there linguistically, but it, because you don't want to legitimatize you know, the language that they're using on the right. So how can you recapture your territory I, the best, the best way to do this, uh, I was taught by Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Elizabeth Warren said, "You know, uh, what is your everyday life like? You go out on the roads. How did those, how did those roads get there? You didn't build them. You know, uh, taxpayers paid for them. Uh, political leaders had to get them to be done." You had to have a, a country, an economy, and the right kind of political leaders to have those roads. You know, uh, you have uh, an electric grid. How did it get there? What are these things we take for granted that we absolutely depend on? Let's make a list. Every day, go out. Is you know, what do you what do you depend on every day? How did it get there? The answer is a political system that cared about everybody, period. And that they used public money, which is everybody's money, for everybody. <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a simple idea and it's, it's never said, except, you know, once by Elizabeth Warren and uh, she has said it so often, you know, without getting a response that, you know, she stopped saying it, but uh, she got the right idea. If you say, what do you depend on every day and how did it get there? 
You know, it got there because people cared. They got their political leaders to vote for it. They got political support for it. And they, this is something that cares about everybody. There are everyday things we all depend on, and they're not there by magic. They didn't just happen. Nothing just happens. And that's something you need to know. And you need to just look around you, you know, every day and say, okay, what am I doing right now? I'm in my car. Okay. I'm on a road. How'd the road get there? There's a gas station. How'd it get there? Uh, the gas station has gas. How did it get there? You know, you ask the question, how did it get there? Right? And uh, what do you depend on and how did it get there? Simple questions. As soon as you ask the question and take it seriously and try to find out that answer, you learn about the important importance for everyday life of political life. So... Mary Beth Beavis from Mainville, Ohio, has a question she hasn't asked yet. So Mary Beth. Just a quick question that kind of builds on what Mary Tom was asking. She said those that are health compliant, which I think is a very tactful way of putting it, and health non-compliant, the ones who <laughs> told me that Bill Gates is putting a microchip in my arm, which I don't know why Bill Gates wants to follow me around, but that's a whole other subject. Um, but anyway, this is a popular um, thing that's been popping up on my social media feed. And I wondered what your response would be to it, because it contains a conservative trigger word. And what should we do with these trigger words? So in response to the question about, I don't want to get my vaccine, people who don't want the vaccine aren't refusing. <laughs> person is refusing to take an antidepressant or refusing to get married you can decline without refusing you decide what's best for you refuse is a manipulative term loaded with unfair moral pressure so there's a part of me that says oh you don't like refuse i will just build that into everything i say to you you're refusing the vaccine but that may not be a good how do you handle this how do you respond to this trigger word of, oh, you can't say I'm refusing the vaccine. You can't refuse unless there's some pressure on you. And you may be resistant to any kind of pressure, even if it's public health pressure. So there are good pressures and bad pressures. Public health pressure is a pretty damn good pressure, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, yes, there are pressures on you. Uh, yes, some of them are evil. Uh, you see it, the evil ones every day. Uh, there are things that, that people tell you to buy or do that you should refuse. Uh, and you should be asking about all those things that put pressure on you. And then you ask, what are the good pressures? What are the ones you glad, you're glad are there? What are the ones that help people? There are plenty of them. You know, and getting vaccinated is one. It's a great great pressure um you know uh, i um i have an old friend um who was uh, uh taught me he, he's asian american he taught me uh tai chi a long time ago he was my tai chi ta when i was studying it but we've been friends ever since and um uh, uh when he found out uh where uh there was going to be vaccinations given he called everybody he knew. Well, he got out his phone list and he just called everybody and said, you go to this address at this time, you park here and you can get vaccinated. Yeah, and then he called the next person and the next person, he called about a hundred people. Those people went down there and got vaccinated, <laughs> right? Went down his list. Now. That's a person who cares and who's willing to act on that care and who doesn't see it as an imposition to act on that care. It sees as helping people he loves, he cares about, not an imposition. And it's, it's a duty, but not a bad duty. It's a, it's a good duty. It's a, good, it's a healthy duty. It's a duty that makes you feel good as well as everybody else feel good. 
you know, he, he got this, I got this call and it said, uh, here's the address. There's the senior center down here for anybody who's over 65. Go down there. Here's where you park. You know, here are good hours to go. You know, you know, see it. I got to make it to the call. <laughs> and, you know, uh, you know, there were just dozens of people that he had sent there. And um, that is what being a good friend is. You know, and I'm lucky I have some very good friends. Well, we're lucky to have you as a friend, Dr. Lakoff, and uh, we're, we're so lucky that you, uh, so happy that you joined us. I can't believe that the hour has flown by and uh, we can't thank you enough for uh, doing what you do, writing what you write, talking. Uh, look, uh, hold on. The, yeah. Chuck, I, I want to turn that around. I want to thank you. I can't thank you enough for doing what you do <laughs> and uh, because I couldn't get anything out there if it weren't for you and folks like you. And, you know, I don't do this alone. You know, I don't, you know, you can't do any of this stuff alone. Uh, you know, any of the books I write are out there because there are people selling those books. There are publishers putting them out. You know, uh, there are people who want to buy them. Uh, there are booksellers who want to sell them. I mean, you can't do anything alone. Uh, you know, uh, there's a, a book I wrote in 1980 called Metaphors We Live By with Mark Johnson. Uh, that is um, uh, has uh, one of the is that one of the the list of the, the top ten most cited books in all of the social sciences ever. Okay, well, how does that happen? It happens because I had a publisher, University of Chicago Press, who put it out there, who kept it in print no matter what. Uh, you know who. Uh, uh, I had the booksellers sold them. Uh, you know, you go into a bookstore, even though it was University of Chicago Press, it was there. University of Chicago Press, uh, I went with them because I asked my local bookseller uh, where, where I should go if I want a university press. And she said, the best one is that one because they have salesmen and they have catalogs. <laughs> 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 you, know, you, ask the, you ask your bookseller, you know, why do you buy why do you buy books from an academic press? And which one? They, they say, oh, it's this one, and here's why. So then you go to that one. You know, uh, you're in a system. You don't function without that system. You don't function without that wonderful bookseller who told me to go to, to this guy. You know, you don't function without the guy in the academic press. You know, you don't do anything alone. Yes. Yes. And then exactly. the question is. Who are the people you depend on? Yes. And, and generally, the people you depend on want to help you. They don't see it as an imposition. They see it as an opportunity to help. And that's what I love about this country. You know, wherever that has happened to me, I've gone to work with such people, and they've all seen it as an opportunity to help me, not as something that, uh, that I, a duty I impose on them that they don't want. They all see it that way. I love it. It's a it's wonderful awesome. country. Yes, it's awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been, it's been great to, to spend this time with you. And uh, 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 everybody uh, say goodbye. And uh, we'll, we'll see you on the flip side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, George. Hi, Mr. Thank Lakoff. you very much, Chuck. Thank you, Dr. Lakoff. Thank you. Thank Hi, you everybody. All. It's been Bye. great seeing everybody. Bye-bye.